Well, thanks, Laura. I'm really excited to be here. Even though I work in Flagstaff for the USGS, it's always good to have an excuse to come down to NAU and interact with the students and faculty. And I'm hoping that what I have to share with you today will be general interest enough that might stimulate some more interactions. In fact, public service announcement to students looking for employment this spring. I currently have an advertisement out that closes on this Friday for a technician to help me with spring field work on tortoises near Joshua Tree National Park. So if you're interested or know somebody that's interested, come see me afterwards. So I first became interested in the intersection between renewable energy development and wildlife 23 years ago, almost to the day. And since then, it's become a major focus of my research activities. It always goes back to turtles. That's my driving passion. I've studied them ever since I was a kid. But um, I started some research on desert tortoises at a wind farm near Palm Springs. And I'll tell you a little more about that as the talk develops. Let's see. So when you ask the average person, what do you think about renewable energy development? This is probably the type of image that's conjured up. These beautiful megaliths of technology, gently turning in the wind, producing a commodity of great value to society. And uh, there's no smoke. There's no pollution. It looks like a really great thing. But what I want to impress upon you today, if nothing else, is that everything we do to the environment has a consequence. There are pros and cons to anything we do. Just because it's a green technology doesn't mean that it doesn't have some negative environmental consequences. So what I'd like to do is review some of those pros and cons with you today. Any of these big wind or solar arrays is a major construction project that requires lots of ground disturbing activity. This in turn affects habitat of wildlife that live within the footprint of the site prior to construction. Some of those impacts can be rather severe as shown in this large PV array, photovoltaic solar energy you can see that whatever habitat was there initially is now gone. And so those, those wildlife either had to move of their own volition or they had to be translocated if they were a sensitive species. So there are costs and benefits of renewable energy development. So all science does start with a question. In about 2010, after doing research for a couple of decades on desert tortoises and wind farm, I started thinking a little more broadly about what do we know from a scientific perspective? What's, what data do we have to understand what the known and potential effects of large-scale wind and solar uh, energy development are going to have on wildlife? And I was particularly focused on things that don't fly, because as it will become obvious to you as we discuss wind energy, that can be a, a, a major source of mortality for things that fly, birds and bats. So I was focused mostly on things that don't fly. So here's what we're going to do. I'm basically going to give you a status of knowledge review for both wind and solar energy about what we know from a scientific perspective about how that development affects wildlife, either neutrally, negatively, or potentially positively. And I'm going to take kind of a life cycle perspective to this, because these things don't fall out of the sky pre-assembled. You know, they have to be made with materials that are often transported from somewhere else. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. And then they have to be maintained, operated, potentially uh, revised as technology improves. And then at some point in the future, it's possible they'll be decommissioned. And all of this takes carbon inputs and energy. And then we'll look at uh, some case studies based on my research on desert tortoises and a wind farm. So the details of what I'm going to talk about today are in two publications. One that I published in Bioscience in 2011, looking at how solar energy development in the southwest United States specifically could affect wildlife. And then another one I published in 2013, basically on the same group of organisms, but focused on wind energy. And I did this in collaboration with a former postdoc of mine, and we continue to publish these papers. So if you're interested in the details, at the end of this presentation, I'm going to show a URL that goes to my website and all of these are available as PDFs. <clears throat> Let's start with solar energy. Solar energy has been around for a comparatively long time. This facility was built over a quarter century ago in the West Mojave Desert of California, and it's still in operation. And it's a concentrating solar facility. Instead of using PV panels, it uses reflective surfaces to concentrate the sun's energy on liquids that are heated up to generate steam, turn turbines, and make electricity. What I want you to notice 
are a couple things. One is the scale of this thing. These are big, and by modern standards, this is a small one. Notice, too, that all the habitat that existed in the footprint of this project is now gone. It's what's called blade and grade construction. Solar energy developers like flat terrain. A couple of degrees tilt at the max, flatter is better. And uh, getting things out of the way that might catch fire or, or impede you know, light getting to your reflective surfaces or PV panels is not a good thing. And so um, this is obviously a loss of wildlife habitat, even though it's, it's generating green energy. If you look at the potential for production of solar energy in the United States, no big surprise, we're there. The desert southwest is a hot spot. And this is true for both concentrating solar and PV solar. But this is also an area of incredible topographic and biological diversity, home to threatened and endangered species like the threatened Agassiz desert tortoise that occurs on the west side of the Colorado River and I've done a great deal of research on. In fact, if you take the ranges of tortoises in the United States and superimpose them on this map, they become a bullseye, thus setting up at least the potential for conflicts between green energy development and conservation of uh, threatened species. So how did we approach this problem? We decided that we would look at all the peer-reviewed literature we could find that referenced solar energy development, solar energy operation, or some aspect of solar energy power and how it might affect wildlife, things that didn't fly. So we looked through all the ecological literature, we looked through all the energy literature, and that's really easy to do these days. There's so many search tools available. When I was a graduate student sitting out there in the audience, we had to go through zoological record and all these other big bound volumes in the library. It was so difficult finding literature, now it's a snap. But we tried to avoid gray literature recognizing that there's some great literature with really great science in it, and there's some scientific literature with really bad science in it. But we focused on peer-reviewed scientific publications because that's the gold standard in our business. And we focused on the desert southwest. So here's the results. Brace yourself. What did we find? One publication. In 1986, some ornithologists went to a concentrating solar facility in the Mojave Desert. They stayed there for 40 weeks. They found 70 dead birds of 26 species, all of which oh, had their feathers burned from flying through the solar flux that was aimed at the central power tower to collect solar energy. And nobody had done any follow-up work on that uh, up to the, at least 2011. If there's work out there still, it's probably in press because I'm not aware of any of that. But this was significant. And this is what that facility looked like. It's no longer in operation, more for economic reasons than anything else. But as you can see, there are concentric rings of heliostats all aimed precisely at this power tower to heat up uh, fluids that in turn heat water, generate steam, turn, turn uh, turbines and make electricity. But people that visited this site at the time said that if an insect flew through there, it was vaporized in a white puff of smoke. And of course, the birds would sometimes fall from the air with their wings flaming. And what caused this is called solar flux. All of the solar energy focused on that tower, between those heliostats and the tower, if you go through it, it's pretty hot. Now, because we found only one paper doesn't mean we can't speculate as scientists, right? We know that there are potential impacts of solar energy development and decommissioning. So we're just focusing on the bread and the sandwich. In a minute I'm going to talk about operation and maintenance. That's the meat. So these things are born and they're going to die. And So we're talking about effects due to development and decommissioning. Obviously mortality and stress, that was documented in that previous publication from 1986, but we know there's also destruction and modification of habitat. We don't need to do research to confirm that. You go out and you see a blade and grade site, you know habitat's been lost. Hopefully it's been mitigated. We know there's going to be impacts of roads. Huge infrastructure of roads is necessary when these sites are being developed initially to provide access to all of the mirrors or all the PV arrays or whatever. And there's a huge literature on the effects of roads on wildlife, most of which is negative. And so we can make inferences about what we might expect on roads associated with solar energy development as well. Then we know there are certainly going to be impacts of dust and dust suppressants. As you can imagine, if you were in the business making money from solar energy, dust would be your enemy. 
because dust prevents the sunlight from having its full effect on a mirror or a panel. So a lot of these sites, when they do the blade and grade, they put down magnesium chloride or other products called dirt glues or soil tackifiers that kind of lock everything in place, which has dramatic effects on runoff in the area and affects runoff downstream as well. And things like magnesium chloride obviously have negative impacts on plants because they're a salt. So more work is needed on that. And then there are off-site impacts. This gets us back to the uh, issue of life cycle perspectives I talked about initially. And so I'll give you an example, but I'm going to use wind energy even though we're going to keep talking about solar. Again, all the materials used to make these facilities has to come from somewhere. Usually it doesn't come from the site where the windmills or the solar energy facilities are going to be manufactured because you're going to need copper for wire, aluminum, iron, steel, fiberglass, plastic, and even rare earth elements like neodymium for magnets in turbines because it's a really good uh, element for doing that. By the way, that's a strategic element in the United States. Uh, almost our entire supply comes from a single mine in Mountain Pass, California, which is near Prim, Nevada on Interstate 15. Some of you have driven over Mountain Pass on the way from Southern California to Vegas, I'm sure. The rest of it's in China. And so uh, if we need a lot of neodymium, we're going to probably have some problems. But these minerals oftentimes are mined, and that was wildlife habitat at one time. And then it has to be transported off-site to facilities that then refine the material to produce the elements or alloys or other products that we need. They then have to be assembled. They have to be transported, again, using more carbon to get them back to the site. And then they have to be assembled, maintained, operated, upgraded, and eventually decommissioned. All that takes a lot of carbon. There are some publications that suggest that some wind and solar facilities may not achieve carbon neutrality for a decade or longer. So let's talk about the meat in the sandwich, operations and maintenance. Again, some familiar things from the standpoint of conservation. Human activities generally create these types of effects in the environment, but there are some you might not be familiar with. We'll talk a little bit more about noise when we do wind energy. Uh, we'll talk a little more about vibration, but electromagnetic fields. You've all probably read articles over the course of time that indicate it's not a good idea to live under a high-tension power line corridor because the electromagnetic ge uh, field generated anytime electricity goes through a cable might not be good for your health. There's, there's links between increased rates of childhood leukemia and various other cancers and rare diseases. There's lots of wires in a wind and solar energy facility, some of them buried, some above ground. The buried ones also generate heat. Again, anytime you pass electricity through a cable, it generates heat. And engineers know exactly how to calculate how much heat there is and how to backfill the area so the cables don't burn themselves up. But that heat affects the microenvironment of the animals that live in that landscape. Climate effects, light pollution. PV panels, anything that's black and shiny that reflects sunlight tends to reflect polarized light, which organisms like birds, bats, and insects use to cue in on water because water also reflects polarized light. And there's been an increased recognition that some of these PV arrays in the middle of the desert, they're picking up carcasses of loons, grebes, coots, um, clapper rails, and various other water birds that are flying over and they see this reflected polarized light and they think, hey, a lake, and they land and it's hard and there's collisions and death. There can be any number of other things, including fire risks. Again, anytime there's electricity involved, there's a fire risk. There are even climate effects. This was a really important paper that the authors used. They assumed that build out of solar energy in the Mojave Desert of California would eventually achieve one terawatt of output using essentially uh, or using mostly PV. That seems to be the uh, technology of preference these days because the price of PV panels has come down dramatically as solar energy has grown. So if you consider the effects that those panels are going to have on the albedo of that previously tan colored desert surface now making it black, if you plug that in with other assumptions into their global circulation models, you get increased temperatures of a half degree centigrade or more. And that's on top of climate forcing from emission of greenhouse gases. So a question that really needs some more scientific investigation is, are we building urban heat islands in the middle of an already hot, arid landscape? And what will the consequences of that be? 
These things are really big. Notice the scale here, five kilometers. This is the Ivanpah Solar Energy Generating Facility out near the state line. That's a state line. This is Prim, Nevada. Las Vegas is up the interstate. But you can see how big these arrays are, each pointed at a power tower that during the middle of the day on a sunny day, it looks like little suns. Has anybody ever driven by and seen this facility operating? It's phenomenal. It, it's otherworldly, particularly in the Mojave Desert landscape. So these things are going to be big. How big? Well, I checked the web today, and according to BLM, as of December of last year, they had applications for 21,000 acres of solar development all on BLM land, and they had issued recent authorizations for 46,000 acres of solar energy development only on BLM lands. Now, there's private lands that are going to be developed for solar energy as well, and they'll need transmission line right of ways across BLM land. I didn't count that in because it's relatively small. But that totals to 106 square miles, or three quarters the footprint of Las Vegas today. And this is just what's on the books right now. This doesn't include what's already built or what will come in the next 10 or 20 years. So you can go to the website. Just go to the BLM national website, look at their energy link, and you can find all these statistics. These are going to be big facilities. Here's another view of the Ivanpah facility to give you an example of how that habitat has been modified. They used a different approach out there. Instead of blade and grade, they actually put in concrete piers and pylons to elevate their, their mirrors off the surface. And they use a technique that uh, I think they call it gentle mowing to kind of chop the heads off the creosote bushes to keep them from interfering with their, their uh, infrastructure. But remains to be seen how the uh, system will respond to that ecologically. So what do we conclude from our solar review? There is a vast deficiency of information on how solar energy is going to affect wildlife. Why is that important? Well, we know that there's going to be some negative effects, and we can probably work hard. Americans are really creative people and come up with effective ways to mitigate many of those known negative impacts. But there are some other impacts that are kind of sleepers. They're out there. They're waiting. They may be some of the ones that were on the list that I just showed you. But until we have empirical data and replicated and controlled research before, after, control impact studies, all the stuff we take for granted in science, we're not going to have that foundation of knowledge that we need. So research is urgently needed. And anybody that's looking for a graduate research topic, this is ripe for the, for the picking. So that's not to say that some encouraging research is not being done and has not been done. Since the publication of our bioscience paper, there's been a couple of publications recognizing the need to make important decisions about siting and design and those sorts of things to try and accommodate the needs of wildlife. Again, I feel it's my job as a public servant, as a USGS research scientist, to point out these things so that we can maximize the societal benefits of renewable energy while minimizing the negative impacts to wildlife and the environment. I think most people would say they want clean energy, but I don't know that we want to sacrifice wildlife to get there. Surely there's a way to find balance. All right, let's shift to wind energy now. We did the same thing, basically. I'll go through a couple of quick slides. This is not to say I'm not interested in birds. I have a paper in press that's coming out next month documenting golden eagle mortality at my tortoise study site in Palm Springs. I only found two birds over the course of my studies there, but it turns out that's two out of 86 that are known countrywide mortalities due to wind energy. I was shocked. I thought, wow, two birds are important. You know, that's, a, that's what, 2%, three, almost 2% of the uh, known mortalities of golden eagles. Turns out golden eagle mortality is grossly underreported because there's no central database or requirement for people to report this. This bird was chopped in half, as you can see, by a fast spinning turbine blade. And um, anyway, birds have a hard time around windmills, but I'm not going to talk about them much more. One thing I do want to bring to your attention, though, is that wind energy is a fairly land-intensive form of energy development. Note that it requires more land per watt produced per hour per year than everything else, including all fossil fuels. The only things that have a higher requirement for space are biofuels. I was really shocked by this. By the way, you look at coal, you think, ah, oh, that seems kind of low. That number includes strip mining. So the authors actually accommodated the strip mining required to feed the coal-fired power plants 
in this calculation. So wind energy is very land intensive. And I might just back up for a moment and say actually solar energy is pretty land intensive too because on average around the world if you calculate the amount of energy the sun puts down on a square meter of earth it's somewhere between a hundred and a thousand watts so maybe in its best place in the Mojave Desert you could run you know 10 100 watt bulbs for a day on a meter so it takes a lot of land to provide the energy that we need as a society whether it's wind or solar so again we went through and synthesized the peer-reviewed scientific literature only and uh, we skipped the gray literature, although we recognize you could probably fill this building with gray literature, you know, uncritically reviewed websites, environmental compliance documents, environmental assessments, the whole works. All that information's out there, but we just looked at the peer-reviewed literature. So we found, again, most published literature is on the effects of wind energy on birds and bats. But maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but at some wind facilities, almost half of the fat uh, fatalities of small birds and bats don't involve strikes. There's a phenomenon called barotrauma where there are these pockets of high and low pressure created as these turbine blades spin and if a small bird or bat flies through it, it can actually cause barotrauma with collapse of the lung. And this has been documented in the peer-reviewed literature by picking up fresh carcasses, no broken bones, uh, you know, no bruises, no internal injuries. They just died because their lungs weren't functioning. So what did we find? Here the literature was a little more diverse. We found 17 peer-reviewed publications that met our criteria. And again, remember, this is focused on non-flying things. And that includes, uh, at the time, about six of my publications on desert tortoises. And you can see it's kind of a hodgepodge. There's no real focused research other than the research I'm trying to do to understand the ecology of tortoises in a wind farm. Uh, it's just a variety of species. But some really interesting results have been reported. I can only highlight a few of them. Again, development and decommissioning have the same types of impacts, known and potential, on wildlife. And then there's some new ones related to operation and maintenance. Um, how many of you have ever heard of shadow flicker or wind turbine syndrome? Anybody? Somebody? Nobody? Well, vibration, certainly, because if these things are spinning around, they look like they're moving really slow, right? If you look at the ones out by Holbrook, but if you actually time how long it takes for a full rotation and you know the diameter that there's, they're sweeping, it's about 200 miles an hour at the tips. But they like to run at a 25 mile an hour wind. If they get going too fast, there's vibrations, it can shake stuff apart. Turbines can actually go into runaway and fall apart and that sort of stuff. But they can really move. Now when they're moving at about four turns per second, that generates vibrations that create infrasound, which is below the level of detection by people. That infrasound can travel long distances. I work for the USGS. We're the earthquake experts, right? I called my colleagues at Caltech in California. I asked them, I said, do you have any earthquake monitoring sensors out near my study site in Palm Springs? Yeah, we've got a few, but the ones that really drive us nuts are in Anza, which is about 40 miles away. They can pick up the white noise on their seismograph of the vibrations created by turbines 40 miles away. And they'd like to get rid of it because they don't know if it's you know, white noise or a real earthquake building up. But the infrasound does have effects on wildlife. Things like elephants communicate with infrasound. We don't have to worry about any of them in the southwest in, in modern times. But tortoises and turtles, be, by virtue of the fact that they have a shell in contact with the ground for a large period of time, they're very sensitive to low-frequency sounds, but we don't know what effect it has on them. Shadow flicker is caused when light reflects off a spinning blade and creates kind of a pulse, if you will. Or, and I've seen this in mountainous terrain, where when the sun rises, big shadows are cast up to a kilometer or more away from the turbines that create these bright, dark, bright, dark patterns on the landscape. We do know from human research that about one in 100,000 people in the general population have photosensitive epilepsy. So when your mom told you don't go to parties with strobe lights, she wasn't kidding. Because if some people watch something that has a strobe effect of more than four per second, they can go into a seizure. We have no idea if this affects wildlife or not, but we're an animal, so maybe it does. And then wind turbine syndrome is highly controversial right now. Some people have complained of living in close proximity to big wind energy facilities in various parts of the world, including Cape Cod, where they have some offshore wind energy. 
and they're claiming that they have headaches and other ailments associated with the vibrations and the shadow flicker and that kind of thing. And some counties are actually drafting ordinances. I know Indiana has an ordinance for Grant County where they have to have windmill setbacks from houses so far because of the issue of, of shadow flicker. So this is an emerging area of research. And then climate effects with wind energy, how can that be? Well, I'll tell you in a minute. Let's talk about noise first. Again, there's a huge literature on the effects of noise on animals, including people. Our hearing is a very finely tuned uh, mechanism for us to detect things around us. And if it's out of whack, it can affect our, you know, it can cause stress, it can cause reduced reproductive uh, success, and it can degrade communication with conspecifics or mask signals of predators approaching. And there's actually some research on this I'll share with you in a minute. So we know a lot about how noise affects wildlife. There was a great study that was done up in Altamont, California, which is between Stockton and, and San Francisco, where wind energy has been developed for a long time. And the authors of this study selected two colonies of California ground squirrels, very social animals, kind of like meerkats with sentries and all that stuff. And they, the two study sites had similar topography, similar squirrel densities, similar predator densities. And they went in and they played back uh, alarm calls on a tape recorder and found out that the squirrels that lived within the soundscape of the turbines showed behavioral differences from the squirrels that were outside. They displayed elevated vigilance and increased caution. That's because they had to, because the sounds of the blades swishing and the gearboxes moving and everything else associated with wind energy created enough background noise that it, it complicated their efforts to detect predators. This was a marvelous study done to very rigorous scientific standards, and it's a classic paper. There's a, a growing body of literature coming out of the marine environment for offshore wind energy development, showing that marine mammals uh, can be exposed to sounds that will cause deafness. When you put those big monopoles that support turbines into the seafloor, you've got to use pile drivers that can create 110 decibels or more of underwater noise that would probably deafen us and maybe even kill us through shock. And they find that uh, marine mammals leave the area immediately after pile driving occurs. And they speculated that the impact zones could extend for as far as 80 kilometers away. So this is an area that's getting more attention from the marine biologists. Again, like I said, when you pass electricity through a cable, it creates an electromagnetic field. This study demonstrated that for the cables associated with offshore wind energy in Europe, when fish would swim toward it, they would turn away instead of cross it. Whether or not that causes a behavioral effect that, uh, that ultimately harms the physiology or survival of the individual or the population is unknown. We just know that like in the squirrel's case, there are behavioral responses associated with this uh, infrastructure. Now here's where we get to climate and wind energy. These things are getting big and the turbine blades are sweeping higher and higher into the atmosphere, so high that they actually destratify the de various thermal layers in the air and can cause changes in the dew point that in turn make these wake clouds which were created off the coast of Denmark. Additional research has been done in the desert published in top-notch journals where they put temperature monitors upwind and downwind of wind energy facilities near Palm Springs. By the way, my tortoise study site would be right about there. And what they found is that these things are high enough that they're causing destratification of the atmosphere and they cause increased temperatures during the daytime of a couple degrees as far as 15 miles downwind and decreased temperatures of about the same magnitude at nighttime. And those are big temperature differences because there are some animals that are very sensitive to fine fluctuations in temperature. So if you take everything that I've learned about wind and solar and now you all know about it, you're all experts on this topic because I've shared the entire literature with you. You could probably Xerox 20 papers, maybe 25 papers, and that's it for the effects of these things on non-flying wildlife. The literature is, again, extremely deficient despite the fact that according to the UN in 2011, a quarter of a trillion dollars was invested worldwide in energy. If you'll recall, that's after the Great Recession. In fact, there was a six-fold increase from 2007 to 2011. So this is like a bulletproof portfolio. You know, the world is really going in a big way for renewable energy. But science is playing catch-up. There's all this money out there, but we still don't have enough 
before and after control impact studies. We don't have replication. Everybody wants to get their permits quickly and build and start making money. There's precious little time for scientists to get out and collect baseline data and be able to do cause and effect uh, experiments. So let's switch gears now, talk a little bit about my research on desert tortoises. Again, this is in the mountains uh, near Palm Springs. This species is federally protected under the Endangered Species Act as a threatened species, which means if it's not protected, it's likely to become endangered. And so I'll share with you some of the major findings from my research. I decided not to include more than two graphs today because it's a hump day afternoon seminar. So if you want graphs, look up my PDFs. This is an aerial view of the study site. This is the San Andreas Fault. Interstate 10 runs up and down this. This goes to LA. This goes to Palm Springs. This is the Banning Fault, a major fault along the uh, system there. You can see it very clearly in this photograph. And you can see the arrays of turbines that were constructed sometime after about 1983 when uh, the site was permitted. It's on BLM land. It's public land. But it is closed to entry because, you know, you don't want people running around expensive infrastructure and getting hurt, et cetera. But it is public land. So finding number one. Um, initially, let's see, I started research there in 94. So it was already about 10 years after operation. I wish I had data before, but I don't. And very few people do for any site in the world with wind energy. And we found at that time that the tortoise burrows were in very surprising locations. Where a tortoise digs a burrow requires a lot of energy because they can be 10 feet deep, uh, they're as wide as a football, and they determine how close you are to your mates, your food, it protects you from fire, from floods, from climatic extremes. So we looked at burrows in the landscape and asked the question, are they random and are they, or do they tend to be dissociated from human disturbances in this industrial landscape? And surprisingly, we found that burrows were often located in very close proximity to these structures this one actually had a clutch of eggs deposited in the mouth of the burrow by the female that was later predated. But, you know, she was going through her full life cycle right there within a couple of inches of the turban. This is a tortoise that's using the concrete uh, foundation for a transformer at the site for a burrow. And we found lots of situations like this. In fact, we found that burrows, statistically, after multivariate analysis, tended to be more likely to be associated with turbans and roads than random points in the landscape, which seemed rather strange and counter to our predictions. But I think that's changed. I'll talk about that in a moment as well. We've also done a lot of work on the reproductive ecology of tortoises at the site. This is the most fecund population of tortoises in the literature. It's not because of the wind energy or the protection of the site or anything like that. It just so happens that they picked one of the most productive sites in the range of the desert tortoise. It receives very predictable winter precipitation that causes germination of winter annual plants that the tortoises eat. And as a result, they produce up to 15 eggs per year per female and as many as three clutches. This tortoise shows the perfect average clutch size for the site is about four eggs. You can see the radio attached to her as well. So we know when they lay their eggs. We know where they lay their eggs. We've done all this research. My overarching question is, how does the ecology of these tortoises differ from tortoises in natural environments? So like I said, we have found the nests. We have entrained the nest to collect hatchlings. This is not staged. That's a real baby tortoise hatching out in the wild for the very first time. And we know that those hatchlings uh, are viable, that they survive for as long as six months. We don't have data beyond that. But they have pretty good survivorship of around 70% uh, annually which is what you expect for an animal with this constellation of life history traits. And we found where the nests are by, you know, when we know the female's gravid by X radiography, we track her with a radio, we put a little bob and a thread on her, and we tie it to a bush and come back the next day and find her. And technicians get down their hands and knees and crawl around and find the nest. And they were very good at it. Out of about 35 tortoises we followed in a couple years, I think they found 32 nests. So they were pretty good. Now we do know that adult mortality has occurred at the site and it's due to site operations. We had a female, not this particular female crushed on the road, but we had a gravid female full of well-developed eggs crushed by one of the maintenance vehicles in 1998. And when I calculate survivorship estimates, about 8.4% of the adult females die per year. And this is what it would look like with no replacement, just to give you an idea. 
and we've documented all of that data too. And uh, that mortality rate, by the way, is well within what's considered normal for a tortoise population, so that's not particularly high. We know that tortoises have also died as a result of using culverts as burrow surrogates. We had a male tortoise with a radio that this burrow or this culvert was half full of sand, so it formed a half moon shape that looked exactly like a tortoise burrow. And he looked pretty smart for using it until the winter rains of 2011 plugged it up, filled it, and we had to dig for six hours to find the tortoise completely entombed in what was like almost well set concrete. It was really hard to get him out. Surprisingly, he was alive, but he died 14 days later due to a heart attack, pneumonia, and other complications from being buried alive. We'd never find him if we wouldn't have had a radio on him. So the question is, since there's lots of culverts, how many more times does this happen? We publish that too in the hopes that this is one of those things that's really easy to mitigate. Instead of a two-foot diameter uh, steel culvert that plugs up with a big rain, put in big concrete box culverts. Or you can put grates on the front of them to keep wildlife from using them. It's a really easy fix. Hopefully people will take advantage of that. Now, like I said, fire also occurs from turbines. It's a globally underreported phenomenon. There are actually companies that specialize in fire detection and suppression systems on board turbines because these turbines can cost almost a million dollars. It's like burning up a 747 engine. You don't want to do that. But occasionally it happens. There have been multiple turbine-induced fires at our site. You'll notice this turbine in the distance has a black spot on it. That's what it looked like. It rained down hot embers that torched 400 acres of high-quality tortoise habitat at the site. We had radios on the animals at the time, and we went out and did surveys within a day. And none of our animals that we know of uh, were killed by the fire. But we do know that tortoises at the site do die from fire. This was a roasted tortoise that was in a shallow burrow, and it was a fire that was started off-site but quickly moved onto the site and uh, burned up at least one tortoise. Many of the animals we have at the site bear these fire scars, uh, usually on the back of the shell because they're facing into a shallow burrow and the fire goes by quickly and roasts their backside. Uh, we haven't seen this animal in a long time. Some of them recover and this one you know to have it down to the bone is pretty bad so I don't know if that one survived. Now Laura wanted me to show you some cool pictures from a project we did that used camera trapping. We put out a bunch of reconnex cameras at tortoise burrows two years ago to try and collect data on tortoise activity and behavior and then relate it to time and of day, time of year, etc. I think we collected from 50 cameras almost 500 thousand photographs during the summer. My technicians are all now half blind. This was unexpected. There's a black bear cub sniffing out a desert tortoise. You don't see that every day. In fact, these bears were introduced from Yosemite into the San Bernardino Mountains that the study site adjoined uh, back in the 20s. So it's an invasive species, if you will, because Southern California was grizzly country. But at any rate, uh, Female was there with his mom. We have pictures of her too, but you'll have to take my word for it. And then here's a burrowing owl that's uh, trying to look tough and keep the burrow that it co-opted from this tortoise. I wish I had the time-lapse series of photographs after this, but I just suspect the tortoise bulldozed it out of the way. They actually are sympatric. They cohabitate as commensals in the burrows. And then we had hundreds of photographs of bighorn sheep utilizing the entrance of tortoise burrows. I think they were eating tortoise scat, which is just basically semi-digested rolls of grass and forbs that the animal eats. Um, and they're very poor at extracting energy from that being an herbivore. So I think that's what the sheep are doing. But we also had a time-lapse series of photographs of the sheep actually using their hooves to collapse the burrow so that they could get farther back in and then rubbing around, getting in, into it as far as they could because that was where the shade was. and It was over 100 degrees. That was a really interesting interaction. Nobody's ever seen that before. And a note to graduate students, if you do camera trapping, you collect a lot of data, you can do some really cool stuff with it. We have a paper that just came out in press that where we took those data on tortoise activity and we were able to plot the probability of a tortoise being active at any time of the day or any time of the year, differences between males and females, all because my technician was smart enough to say, hey, we've got a timestamp on every photo and we have a remote access weather station I'll download the temperature data and do the analysis. So he modeled all this just based on a bunch of pictures. Okay, so 
kind of wrap up the tortoise part and everything else. What have we seen so far? Well, we thought the tortoises will adapt to the presence of energy infrastructure in the short term because my early research suggested tortoises could live in close association with these features. But after collecting 20 some years of data on a long-lived animal, you start thinking, okay, maybe now I'm going to see something that I can understand because it's really hard to study an animal that can live for 80 years in one or two years and say, aha, I understand. But it seems like tortoises are actually avoiding the areas of highest road and turbine density. We've actually modeled the distribution of burrows and the level of activity per burrow. Most tortoises and most burrows tend to be far away from the turbine. So this could be a long-term effect. We don't know. We do know that site operations can cause injury and mortality. Other than that, the demography and ecology of the population appears to be very similar to values reported in the literature for natural habitat. But a real fundamental question for me that I'm just starting to investigate in my research is, is there recruitment? We know the females lay more eggs than any other tortoise population. We know that those eggs are by and large fertile. The hatchlings have the ability to survive six plus months. But all of my animals are the same adults that I've been marking and measuring over the last 18 years. So now maybe I've been there long enough that I'll start seeing some turnover in the adult population. Very difficult to find juvenile turtles, particularly desert tortoises. It's almost like they're a different species. They're active more in the winter. Uh, there's just a whole suite of things that make them more difficult to find, notwithstanding their small size. But this is going to be a crucial question because if everything else looks good up here, but in the long run this is a decadent population that's not being replaced, then if this is a reflection of wind energy's effect, it's probably not a good idea to develop this in tortoise habitat. So we know that many species are going to come in contact with our renewable energy developments throughout the United States, whether it's migratory birds on the Great Plains, whether it's uh, seabirds off, off the coast of New England from wind energy, or whether it's animals that live in the Mojave Desert. Wildlife is going to come in contact with this, and we need to understand what their needs are so they can be better accommodated. Now, I don't want to end on a, a, a bad note. I mean, I think we all want clean, cheap energy. That's, that's the goal that, that our country has set out for us, and I think it's a laudable one. But we've got to get some more research. So here's some examples of questions that I think are just burning for young graduate students to grab a hold of and wrestle. Before after control impact studies, we found less than half a dozen examples worldwide. Everybody comes in after these things are built, like I did, but we don't have data from before to really compare and look at cause and effect. What are the cumulative effects of large numbers of these dispersed all over the landscape versus saying, okay, we're going to identify energy zones where we can make you know, good amounts of energy, but we know that these aren't important wildlife areas. What density or design of development maximize energy benefits while minimizing negative effects to wildlife? Is it possible that we can have our cake and eat it too? And where are the best places to put them? In the case of my study site, since it's such a good, high-quality tortoise study site, it probably wasn't a good idea to put wind energy there. But back then, people weren't thinking about that because the tortoise wasn't a listed species then. So if you want more information or copies of any of the publications that were cited, you can uh, email me. You can go to this website here. It's, it's really easy to remember. If you don't want to write that URL down, type USGS Professional Pages and my last name, and it'll be the first thing on Google. And then you can go in there and look at anything you want, take anything you want, and uh, hopefully this has been informative. Thank you very much. Right. And I think, uh, I don't know if it was his own model, or maybe he worked with them on it, but desert tortoise uh, is trying to think of the dog dog or something. Grim. Uh, so I don't know. Do you have any comments on, on, on the modeling and how much space you have? Basically, sure. so they're going to be in Kansas. Well, they were there in the Eocene. Why not, right? during the last thermal maximum. Anyway, Barry is one of my collaborators, or vice versa, depending on who's, who's given the talk, I guess. But I provided him with all the demographic data from this population. And what, what uh, Paul, right? Yep. What Paul is talking about is 
this professor up at UC Santa Cruz, Barry Sinerbo, has developed some very interesting models where if you assume an animal, let's say a lizard, needs eight hours of activity during a particular temperature window to harvest the resource it needs for growth, maintenance, storage, reproduction, survive. Now the temperature goes up a degree because of global warming or, or some other factor, and now that uh, range of activity is condensed, right? It, it's, it's squeezed a little bit. So the lizard has to work extra hard. At some point, if temperatures continue to go up, that range of, that window of activity gets squeezed so much that the population becomes extirpated, that they can't, they don't have the opportunity to get the requisite uh, uh, resources that, that they need. And so uh, Barry has tested this very effectively with lizard populations in the southwest U.S. and northwestern Mexico. And he's found about 77, 78% correlation between populations that he predict, predicted would be alive and populations that he predicted would be gone based on research over the last 50 years or so where people said, oh, yeah, I studied that lizard in Big Bend in the 60s, and they were doing great. And so he went back, and the model said they shouldn't be there, and they were gone. Well, we've done the same thing with tortoises, not only desert tortoises, but tortoises worldwide, and came up with some very interesting results. The model that he used, um, that you're talking about, used demographic data, and we know the relationship between, one of the things I didn't show you is, temperature affects reproductive output in, in tortoises like a conveyor belt. Warm temperatures, they crank the eggs out faster, they lay them earlier, et cetera. So we, we understand how temperature affects the reproductive physiology of this animal. And he's run through some models with this tortoise data that shows that by, is it 2080? 2080, virtually the entire range of the desert tortoise in Arizona and California, Nevada and Arizona is no longer suitable. And, and he's not the first person to suggest this from modeling data. There's only a few little spots on sky islands, if you will, where it might be habitable for tortoises. The model says tortoises should be in Kansas by then because that's where they were in the last thermal optimum in the Eocene-Paleocene time period. It's well, well documented in the fossil record. But of course, they had hundreds of thousands of years to get there, right? They can't do that anymore. So if that model's true, and we'll all be dead when when uh, we test that model, um, it's going to be pretty bleak. But models, you know, all models are wrong. Some are very useful. Yes? What are the survey methods you use to locate the tortoises to find them before you take a sample? That's a good question. So you can use systematic surveys, and I've done those in Joshua Tree National Park where you identify, say, a square mile plot you grid it off, and then you walk transects back and forth looking for the animals so that you get essentially 100% coverage. The terrain here is pretty, pretty rough, and so that's not a really uh, good way to find them. We just get groups of volunteers to go out there with us, and we just fan out over the landscape, and we've become very effective at finding tortoises. They're pretty much homebodies, so I was worried at first after the first four years I had invested with radios on tortoises the whole time, and then I had to take them off. I thought, what a bummer. I'll never find them again. They were right where we found them the first time. Is that well, the problem is we're doing most of our surveys for adult tortoises from April through July, which is when most of the adults are active. They have a, about a six week preferred window of activity when you have good germination of winter annual plants from the winter rains that occur in this part of the desert. The juveniles, on the other hand, if you're this big and you come out of your burrow in January in the sunshine, you heat up like that because your surface to volume ratio is so, so large, right? An adult could sit in the January sun all day long and never achieve uh, a temperature that would allow it to move around and, and uh, digest food and that kind of thing. The other thing is, when the winter rains fall in California, the timing and quantity of rain is very important between November and March. And if you have good rainfall then, you start getting germination of those grasses and forbs that the tortoises eat in December and January, and they're about an inch high. And that's about as high as a baby tortoise can reach, because by the time April comes and the plants are this high, they're unavailable. It's all woody stems. It'd be like eating trees. So we're not out there when the babies are out there. 
Yes. Well, nesting occurs as early as about April 5th. It occurs as late as about July 30th. And it takes anywhere from 60 to 100 days. Um, second clutches tend to hatch out faster than first clutches because they're deposited in the ground uh, later in the year when the temperatures are warm. We have a publication on that too. Yeah, that's a good question. What kinds of windmills are they, uh, if I'm getting the question right, and what can we do? What research is being done to try and deter collisions from birds and bats and those sort of things? The turbines that you see here in this photograph are actually on a private parcel of land that's adjacent to my study site. This is kind of the, the newest generation of turbines, big, tall monopoles with huge blades and generators that put out one to two megawatts of, of energy, which is phenomenal. It's very expensive. The ones at my study site are the old lattice style. Nobody's using those anymore. Maybe some third world countries are buying our excess or something like that. But we still have the original turbines on my study site that were installed in the 1980s. So those Vestas turbines manufactured in Denmark are really reliable. They're kind of like a Volvo, I guess, in Sweden. It lasts forever. Um, so there are lots of different types, but this is what you're going to see mostly in the future, this monopole design. Now, your question about light, noise, and what, what things can be used to kind of deter collisions, those have all been tested. Radar, sonar, uh, loud noise, like 120 decibels. Um, and some of these things have been shown to cause reduced mortality of birds and bats, but none of them have eliminated it. But this is a, a really... Uh, active research field right now and there are lots of people looking at that. I'll let you decide. Well, that's a really good question, and it's, it's got a lot of political ramifications, which I won't go into because I'm not a politician, I'm a scientist, but our energy distribution system is set up to have large energy companies like California Edison and, and APPS in Arizona and, and the Salt River Project, and those, those, those organizations generally control the infrastructure, the distribution system, the rates, et cetera. And so to move into a model of distributed solar or distributed wind like countries like Germany. Do you know Germany is the number one country in terms of wattage produced by solar energy worldwide? I think we're number six or seven in the U.S. And Germany is a cloudy, you know, northern latitude country. But they have very, um, very uh, active programs to encourage development of distributed solar, distributed wind, those sorts of things. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but I think one of the drivers is going to be price. And, you know, the PV panel price has fallen as demand has gone up. When it's, you know, cheap for me to put solar panels on my roof and I can make my money back in a few years, I'm going to do it. Did I answer your question? It's up to Laura. Right. Is that one used more often than using something that's wind power? And um, I, I just wanted to see if you You know, I think that that's the first one that I'm aware of. And uh, it's largely because that project became extremely controversial. After it was permitted the first time, they found out that the number of tortoises on the site was grossly underestimated. And so um, I, I don't know a whole lot about that project. By the way, my research has been funded by the California Energy Commission, the BLM, the National Park Service. I've never been funded by the energy industry. Uh, just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I don't know. There's probably, 
if, if that's the only one that I know of, it may be the only one, and there's not a lot of comparative data available. But it's an interesting concept because, you know, it's like wind energy. You, when you build the turbines, they're widely spaced enough that there's a matrix of original habitat that remains. So some of the needs of wildlife, if not all of the needs, might be met. The key is, can you do that with solar? And I don't know, the, the spacing and such might be prohibitive for industries to say, oh, we'll give a green belt you know, 20 meters wide. And they may not be able to achieve financial solvency with that kind of accommodation. I don't know. She's tough. <laughs> yeah, you can go. Um, so from your camera data, I'm curious, what time of day are recording most accurate? And does that vary from evening to sunny to early? Both. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, if it's uh, spring and there's there was very little winter rain and it got hot real fast and burned up whatever germination there was, tortoises aren't going to be very active because there's nothing to do. Right? They're not going to go out and find anything to eat. So it, it definitely depends on time of day, time of year, and environmental conditions. That paper by... Well, as it gets hotter, so in April, tortoises could be active any time of the day. Probably more active in the middle of the day because it's still not really hot. But by the time June and July come around, when it's 105 degrees, Tortoises are going to only be active at dawn and dusk, very, very narrow windows. They have a critical thermal uh, maximum of about 43 degrees centigrade, so they can't take a lot of heat. In fact, some people would argue that it's a misnomer. The desert tortoise is probably not well adapted to modern desert conditions. It has a series of exaptations from its most recent common ancestors that allowed it to accommodate this landscape, which only appeared within the last 10,000 years. There was no creosote bush in North America until 18,000 years ago. That's well documented in pack rat middens. Thank you.